Yesterday, one of my heroes, Chief Clarence Louie of the Asoyuz Indian Band, was in town. I sat down with him for this exclusive interview. Chief Louie, it's great to see you again. I, I want to reintroduce you to our viewers since it's been a while. Tell me a little bit about your First Nation, where it is, how many folks are on there, and, and what it's like being chief. The Soyuz Indian Band is located in the South Central British Columbia, right down by the U.S.-Canada border. 32,000 acres, just over 500 people. Uh, our small little claim to fame is we have more band-owned businesses on a per capita basis than any other First Nation in this country. And that's what I like doing. I like creating jobs and making money. Those are the, my two things I like doing as chief. I understand that people from off reserve actually come to work in the businesses that the band has set up. Oh, hundreds of people. Um, we have uh, the Vincor Winery, Jackson Triggs is on our reserve. It's been here since 1980. Uh, Spirit Ridge, we partnered up with a group out of Calgary. And so we've got some pretty good joint ventures happening. One of our, our major projects that's happening right now will be the first time ever on an Indian reserve whether in the, in the U.S. or Canada, a provincial or state prison is going to be built. Oh, really? So we're just finalizing that, and uh, it's going to start construction in August, and it's a $200 plus million dollar project, so it's a big project. So you've got agriculture, you're building the prison, do you also have tourism and other, other businesses going on? We have golf courses, we own a golf course, we lease out of the land for a golf course, so we cover all the bases. Um, we just opened up an industrial park, that's where the prison's going, so we have industrial, commercial, um, tourism, residential, so non-natives live on our reserve as well. Well, it isn't just, uh, I've been chief since 1984, December 84, but before that some of the leases were in place in, since the 60s. Our first lease was in 1963, and then our first band-owned business was in 1968, all before my time. So our previous leaders, chiefs and councils, most of the Sioux Indian band members, and I don't think it's different on any reserve, most of my people want to work. And I know full well you can't depend on it, the, the federal government to, to provide real jobs other than bureaucratic jobs at a band office. The sad fact is on most native reserves, the biggest employer is the band office, and it shouldn't be. The biggest employer should be the economic development sector of that First Nation. And there's a handful of First Nations in every province doing what OCUS is doing. We're not the only ones that are creating jobs and having hundreds of non-native people come, to the re come onto the reserve to go to work or having non-native people feel safe and secure and taking their life savings and building million dollar houses on the reserve. In fact, last week one of the developers told us that a house that's being built on our reserve on a least, least land, 99-year prepaid lease, is $1.5 million. Mm. So that non-native couple feels safe to build a multi-million dollar house on our property. That's, that's unusual. I mean, w the story we hear too often, it's a heartbreaking story, of young Aboriginal men and women who can't make a go of it on the reserve, so they leave their home, they leave for the city, because they can't get a job. Well, you're saying that it's actually a magnet for others to come on, how, how did you get that culture of entrepreneurialism? Well, uh, under the federal uh, Indian leasing process, it's been going on for decades. Mm -hmm. Tutsina in Calgary has Redwood Meadows. Again, million dollar homes. Um, there's a lot of bands right across the country that have federal leased lands. I mean, they're done through the Department of Indian Affairs. They're secured leases, they're mortgageable leases. They're all done with lawyers involved. So, so the paper is just as good as anywhere else. And, and so a lot of non-native people live on Indian reserves mm. through federal land leasing. What's the total workforce on your Indian band, on the reserve? Because it's not just band members, it's... it's no, we, we, we have more jobs than we have band members, which is a good... So you, you, did you say 500 band members? How many band members and then how many folks come on the band, to, uh, the reserve to work? Oh, there's probably, depending on the season, because, you know, the vineyards are seasonal, golf is seasonal, hotel is seasonal, or campground is seasonal. We probably create around well over 500 jobs. Mm. So with the prison coming on, we're going to be up to 1,000 jobs on the reserve. Is that a provincial or a federal prison? It's a provincial. And the last number we, we, we took, one thing I'm really proud of is stat, because you've got to keep stats. That's the problem with most First Nations. They don't look at their numbers. And I firmly believe you've got to keep a scorecard. You should keep score. 
Did you come from an accounting background or like, what, no, no. did you just learn this? Did, did you grow up in a family that was business oriented? Like, how did you get to be a guy who loves doing business, loves making money, to, as you say? How did that, how did, how did you just a hard, Just a simple hard work ethic that most Canadians have. When was your first job? Oh, geez, uh, when we were growing up, the band only had one business back in the um, early 70s. And it was the vineyard. So all the native kids on the reserve, our first job was working in the vineyard. That's working in the That's fields. hard work. It's hard work. It's working in the fields. No shade. Had to get up at 4 in the morning to be out there at 5 and get off at 1. So summer to when... That's a work ethic. That's a lesson right there. When you weren't going to school, you had to go to work in the fields, mm -hmm. in the vineyards. And uh, I know I didn't want to spend the rest of my life working in the fields. Mm -hmm.